All right, so 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's just go ahead and begin in verse 1. So in verse 1, I'm reading from the King James Version, the Holy Bible. <laughs> um, it reads, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, verse 4, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Now, on that somber note, <laughs> let, me, let me just share again that these are attitudes that all of us have dealt with at some point or another. Notice I'm not pointing my finger at you in any way. I've experienced some of this stuff, and I want to encourage you, take a deep breath. We've got the Holy Spirit and God's Word. He's the one that's able to help us overcome these. But as Paul is writing to his son Timothy, it's interesting that he's talking about in these last days, perilous times would come. Now, let me just read verse 1 again, just, just from a few different translations. So again, in, in the King James Version, it said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Here's another translation of that same verse, verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Another translation says, but you must realize that in the last days the times will be full of danger. It's almost like we're reading off of today's newspaper articles, right? Or blogs. Look at this last translation. You may as well know this too, Timothy, that in the last days, it is going to be very difficult to be a Christian. And again, Paul is sharing this by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to his son Timothy, preparing him. But again, I got through telling you all the stuff that he had gone through. Here in the United States, we are blessed that we don't experience the persecution that others experience in other nations. Would you agree with me that there are other nations in this planet at this time that have to meet underground for fear of persecution, for fear of torture, for fear of death? And yet, by the way, Paul still has it in mind. He's still kingdom-minded. He's still thinking ahead. He's still thinking about the next generation that he wants to leave his son in the faith equipped so that he's not absorbed with his culture of his day. Now, as he's instructing him, the thing that really amazed me is that again and again, Paul had a great way of communicating to him, hey, I'm not going to be here much longer. In fact, in the, in the next chapter, chapter 4, he says, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. That's actually a reference to the book of Leviticus where you would have a wine offering that you would pour on the altar of the Lord. And it was a way of thanking the Lord for the fruit of the vine. He's using that same analogy. I will be poured out. And in fact, this uh, Mamertine prison that he was in, it was just a holding cell. Anyone who was in that prison knew that it wasn't long before you were going to be executed. And now, be aware, I think one of our songs was talking about how our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was placed right on that cross. It's really, truly interesting for me to know that, do you remember that Paul was a Roman citizen? And as a citizen of Rome, he would not have been stoned to death in that execution. He would not have been put up on a cross as an execution. Their way of a noble death was to cut off his head. And it's, it intri the, the reason this intrigues me so much is because yet through all of this, he knows this kind of stuff is coming, 
And yet again, he's not only encouraging his son in the faith, but each and every one of us. Now, again, as we're looking at this, he listed about 20 things to be mindful and watchful of. So let's go through these 20 or so things, as time permits, to give us a good idea of not only what it, what it is, but also how to stand against it. And can I just give you the end from the beginning? The, the answer to all of this is found in this same chapter with the last few verses of this chapter. So I'm going to make sure we get to that before we finish, but let's go through that list again starting in verse 2. Again, signs of the times. If you were going to give this message a title, signs of the times. Okay, so looking at verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Let's just stop right there. Lovers of their own selves. Pretty much, in my opinion, and you know, I've heard this saying before, opinions are like noses. Everybody's got one. It usually has a few holes in them, right? So this is my opinion, but in my opinion, Paul lists truly the foundation of all of these other bad attitudes, if you will, corrupting things that we all face in the last days. Lovers of themselves. Men will be lovers of themselves. And as I got to digging in a little bit more, um, let's see, it's, it's, uh, the idea that I had was this. It's, it's basically saying that the whole world revolves around you. Have you ever known anyone that's like that? Don't raise your hand. Oh, okay, so I, I saw a hand. Oh, okay, well, at least I said, have you ever, have you, has anyone ever been this person? Don't raise your hand. But it's like the whole world re revolves around this person. You know how they can screw on a light bulb? They just stand right there, and since the whole world is revolving around them, that's how they screw it on. It, it, it's that imagery. When you start studying it, it's that imagery. But again, lovers of themselves, men will be lovers of themselves. Don't you see that today in our entertainment industry? Sports figures, I'm the best. There's nobody like me. Hmm, wow. And yet in Philippians 3.3, 3, when Paul is writing to the Philippian church, he says, I have no confidence in the flesh. In Philippians 3.3, 3, he says that, and in another portion of Scripture, he also says, if anyone could have an ability to boast, it would be me, a Hebrew of Hebrew. I mean, he goes through, you know, his long lineage, and yet he says, I have no confidence in the flesh. I put no con. What, what I'm doing right now, what pastors do day, week in and week, in, week out, day in and day out, we have no confidence in this flesh. It's in Christ Jesus. You look at Galatians 5.24, just as another point to counter being a lover of your own self. Galatians 5.24 says, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. My brothers and sisters, we are living in the last of the last days. We're seeing this week in and week out. Um, I was listening to Cleve Walker this morning on WAFJ, going, coming in, and he said he started to get a little perturbed by what he was watching on the news. Maybe the word that he used wasn't perturbed, but he was, <laughs> he was just starting to feel just bad about what's going on, and he was starting to get frustrated and flustered, and, oh, no, the whole world is going... You know what the saying is. And, and he said, he just gently heard the Lord say, why are you worrying about stuff you can't even control? Just put your focus on me. And we already said it this morning, get your joy back in me. Your joy is in me. Guys, even though it's the last of the last days, for us, rejoice, for our redemption draws near. That's the positive end of this. The key of this teaching today is to help you guard against some of these attitudes that creep in. And the reason they're more dangerous is because they're subtle. They're very subtle. You know, it's, let me give my personal example. For example, it would be real subtle to be a lover of my own self is it, if after a teaching like this, someone comes up and genuinely says, Louis, that really ministered to me. Thank you. And deep down within me, I start saying, yeah, I got it. I'm telling you, yep, it's me. 
It's all me. You see how subtle it can be? It's like a slithering snake, isn't it? Say that five times real fast. <laughs> slithering snake it is. God's kind of love. Now, by the way, when it says lovers of their own selves, God's not saying for, your, for you not to love yourself or have a right estimation of yourself. God's kind of love has an inflow from God and an outflow to not only oneself first, but to others, right? So there's balance here. God is not saying through Paul that you should hate yourself. No, 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 no. How can you love others, right? Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine. 39, love your neighbor as yourself. How can I love my neighbor if I don't even love myself? And how can I even love others without receiving his love for me first? Amen? So there's balance in this. And by the way, in, in the little example that I just shared, you know, about being too big for my britches, right? <laughs> Big-headed, whatever you want to call it. Philippians 2, 3 says, In lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. So when I esteem you better than myself, I find myself right where I need to be, in a place where I'm not allowing myself to be a lover of myself. Okay, that's one. We'll get to as many of these as we can. <laughs> so the second one, covetous. Now I tell you, one of the key things, and <laughs> I, I told my wife, or I'm sure I told someone else, for the longest time when I started, when I was given the opportunity to share, I, for whatever reason, I would always talk about money and I would always talk about sex. And the main reason I talked about those is because those were two things my parents had when I was young and they never told me anything about them. <laughs> so this morning, <laughs> I am talking to you not about sex, but I am talking to you about money in a different form. Because it, over here, the second point is covetous covetous hmm covetous L another translation i really like just to follow the theme of lovers of themselves which was the first the second one is covetous or lovers of money now again with all of this god is not saying you shouldn't have any money but there's balance and we'll bring in the balance here all right so covetous now one key thing about money is that money is amoral right? It has no morals. It's neither good nor bad. It just depends in the hands of who it goes into, right? If it goes in the hands of, let's just say, a ruthless gang, man, they can use it to uh, do all kinds of crazy stuff that is just going to promote the enemy's kingdom. You put it in Pastor Brian and Rhonda's hand, we're going <laughs> to we're going to go ahead and build an orphanage in Sam Zambia. We're going to do stuff in Aruba. We're going to do stuff here at Project Life. Money is amoral. How many of you have heard that money is the root of all evil? Oh, hold on. Hold on. I just was testing you. I was just trying to see if you guys were awake. 1 Timothy 6.10 says it's the love of money. Money in and of itself is not the root of all evil. It's the love of it. You can have the love of money and not have a dime to your cent and be willing to kill someone for $100. On that note, Colossians 3.5 also says that covetousness is as the sin of idolatry. You say, well, I don't have any idols, you know, that we bow down to in our home like they used to or in some other nations they do. But here it says if you're greedy for gain for your own purposes and you don't look beyond your own self, that's a form of idolatry, covetousness. Now, again, let's bring some balance. Does God want you to be broke? No. It says quite the opposite as you look through the scriptures. In fact, as you look through the scriptures, you recognize first and foremost that he wants us blessed to be a blessing. The key thing here, the big idea here with covetousness is refuse to have that vacuum cleaner mentality. Can I give you that word picture? Where you're sucking everything into yourself, but nothing goes back out. <laughs> I'm being nice to you guys, right? <laughs> I'm seeing these stairs. Louie, where are you going with this? Just refuse that. And the way you do that is you love others more than yourself. 
look at this idea too. Um, man, this scripture you guys know, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all of these other, other things will be added to you. We hear all of that, but how much are we actually putting it into practice day in and day out? Do you know what a sign of Christian maturity is? Do you want to know one of the signs is? Is when you start giving. I figured that kind of go over that way, but that's all right. <laughs> so one of the signs of Christian maturity is that you're thinking more about others than yourself. In fact, I actually found another scripture that I thought was really good that went along this. Do you know why you work? What's even the purpose of work? Ephesians 4.28 says it. And I'm, I'm referring to these so that you can type them out and then you can go back and listen to it. But I just want to make sure I use the time well. But Ephesians 4.28, let him that steal or that stole steal no more. But rather, rather let him labor, work, working with his hands the thing which is good. For what purpose, Paul? That he may have to give to him that needs. It changes the whole perspective about going to work. When you specifically go to work with the intention, Lord, I'm going to work so that I have to be able to give to others. Man, when God has your heart that way, when God has your pocketbook that way, it is amazing what he can get through you. In fact, uh, one of the key sayings, it, 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 the analogy, I, I keep thinking about these analogies, these word pictures, it's like a, a hose, a water hose, right? Water's flowing through the hose, the hose gets wet, right? But it also disperses wherever it's pointed, right? And so the saying is, if God can get it through me, then he'll get it to me. If God can get it through you, then he will give it to you. In other words, if he can entrust you with riches, with wealth, then he'll be able to get it to you. And 2 Corinthians chapter 9 talks about that, that God gives seed to the sower. So the flip side of that is, is if you don't have anything to give, maybe right now you're not being seen as a sower. And the key in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is you can start asking Lord, I want to be a sower. Help me be a sower. I want to work for the purpose of blessing others. That is my heart, Lord. And when you have that heart, that's his heart. If he can trust you with it, boom, he'll let it flow through you. The key, the reason why he doesn't let us be multi-billion trillionaires, he's not. He recognizes that those that have sought after wealth in that respect for themselves... They have been pierced with many sorrows. He loves you enough not to give you more than you can handle. And don't we do that with our kids? I mean, how many of you would think me a good dad if I said, Samuel, here are the keys to the car, son. Go ahead. Have fun. Have at it. He's putting everybody else at risk. The same thing. You still love me, right? Say, Pastor Louie, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God is so good. Do you want me to give you a good definition of biblical prosperity? You can, you can, you can write it down. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. That's where God wants you. He doesn't want you covetous. He doesn't want you a vacuum cleaner. He wants you to be this liberal giver. Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Your heart needs to be in Jesus. And when your heart is in Jesus, you'll have his same heart to give to people. Amen? All right, so, so far we've gotten through two. Lovers of themselves <laughs> and lovers of money. But do you see how it all stems back out from lovers of themselves? Okay. All right. The next one. We've kind of been touching a little bit on this one. We're, we're still in verse two. Boasters. Boasters. So this was the idea that I got when I was looking at that word. Uh, and when you look up the word, it actually says empty pretenders. Oh, that says a lot, doesn't it? Empty pretenders. I was like, oh, okay, Jesus. <laughs> when have I been an empty pretender? Forgive me. <laughs> 
But here's the idea. A boaster is like an inflated balloon, huge on the outside, but empty within. They brag on their own accomplishments, talents, possessions, and so forth. Again, going back to my example earlier. They're braggadocious. Have you ever heard that word, braggadocious? But again, notice that boasting is rooted in self-love. Look at me. Look how pretty I look. <laughs> look at me how well I teach. Look at me how well I lift weights or do this or well, whatever it is. Look at me how well I'm a salesman or how well I do my job. Look at me. You know, isn't that the sin that messed Satan up? I like how Pastor Brian has shared if pride or boasting can turn an angel to a demon, what do you think it can do to us? It's always gotten me to think about that. So in thinking about that, what should we as godly people, because we got up early, extra early this morning. So what's the flip side to this? You know, what should we be doing? Well, humility, I definitely heard that that's the key word. And Psalms 34 verse 2 actually talks about that. But who should we be boasting in? Ourselves or the Lord. That's Psalms 34, verse 2. My boast will be in the Lord. Listen, what you guys don't recognize and realize is that after I've had the opportunity to prepare and share a message like this, I'll go home, I'll spread across the bed, and I'll say, oh, thank you, Jesus. That could have been a train wreck, but you helped it be so good. And he's really the one that's able to take all of these thoughts and ideas and package it in such a way that each of you can take and do something with it. It's him. So I'm going to make my boast in the Lord. Psalms 34, verse 2. Here's something else just to equip you. Galatians six fourteen says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Godly people will boast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 and I really like this one because it got, it got me thinking. For who makes you to differ from another? This is 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Who makes you to differ from another? And what do you have that you didn't receive to begin with? Now, if you did receive it, why do you glory as if you hadn't received it? How many of you know, no matter how successful you are in life, if you didn't have the very breath that God gave us to breathe, we're out. See ya. <laughs> Is that quick? Right? He upholds everything by the word of his power. We're alive. We have what we have because of him. I will make my boast in the Lord. Guys, I got to tell you, you know, where we live right now, what God has blessed us with, our family, our clothes, our beds. I mean, when you start taking it down to the specifics of all the things that we enjoy, there is no good reason why we should be boastful, braggadocious. And you know what's interesting about this, and I'm, uh, it, it flows right into this next part. It's this next part where boasters and pride, that's the next one, pride, go hand in hand. Do you know why it's, do you know why boasting or being proudful is so contrary not only to the Lord but in Proverbs chapter 6 it's one of those things that he hates pride he hates it it's because he said of his own self Jesus said this I'm lowly of mind I'm meek come learn from me let me give you this idea as we jump into pride you know, the, the idea of looking down on others instead of recognizing everything you've received, it's been given to you. God's power flows best through humility. And the picture that I had was this. How many, how many of you are either electricians, have worked with electricity, or you've gotten zapped at some point? There we go. We get, in, fact, in fact, Pastor Brian was talking about this last week where uh, I think it was one of the showers. 
in Africa that he was working with, it actually has the heater uh, on the faucet as it's coming out. And he learned real quick, you don't want to mess with that once you're, you, when you're showering. So water is a good conductor of electricity, apparently. <laughs> um, what else is a good conductor of electricity? Help me out. Uh, copper, so metals, right? Specific types of metal. Okay, on the flip side, what's not a good conductor of electricity? Rubber, wood, right? Okay, so look at it that way. God's power can flow best through copper wire, right? Uh, water, quote unquote, humility, versus trying to flow through someone who is too big for his britches. We, we can just put it that way. Who thinks, well, this person got healed because of me. Man, please, you couldn't heal a gnat, right? <laughs> it's God's power flowing through you. I'm, I'm keeping it real, real this morning, right? <laughs> I'm also trying to help you stay away <laughs> because I know I have this voice, vocal volume. Welcome to WIFM. This is your host, Louis Ramos, and I don't want you to go to sleep in that respect. So God's power flows through humility, and pride is a stench in his nostrils. In fact, 1 Peter 5 and James 4 says that God resists the proud. He keeps someone that's prideful at arm's length. And actually, if you dig deep a little bit further, he actually makes war against that person. He stands at war against that person. I prefer the, the, the arm length, but now, now he's like, he's against me. Why? Because that's not who he is. He's not that way. Jesus said, I'm lowly of mine. I'm meek. Learn from me. Now, I'm sharing these things with you because there are two primary, two primary ways of looking people that might be beneath you in terms of, for example, if you own your own business and you have people working for you, there's structure, there's authority, right? And so you may have people working for you, but there's two primary ways of looking at people that are maybe working for you currently, right? You can either look at them that prideful manner from that very ugh, bad perspective, which is kind of the perspective that King Saul had of David. You remember how Saul looked at David as a threat? Instead of looking at that next person to come up after you with leadership potential. Do you know that's what Jesus did with his disciples? He looked at people that, his disciples specifically, that were for him, that were following him, with the potential to do greater things. Our pastors consistently share that with us. Let our ceiling be your floor. That's the correct way of looking at people that are maybe working for you. Amen? Amen. You guys are doing so good, and it looks like, <laughs> and it looks like it's almost time to go. You guys did so well, but now I haven't given you the answer. Now, I told you the issues, but I want to make sure before we end, and I'm going to finish up. In fact, you guys can go ahead and stand up with me. I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> just stand up with me. There you go. <laughs> you guys are doing so good. So I want to give you the answer. I don't want to leave you with just this long list of, oh, God, these are signs of the times. Okay, what is the solution? Well, the solution begins in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. And just give me a moment to read it out to you. That way you can, you can hear it for yourself. Because the key is always going to be found in Scripture. When something's up with your car, do you need to be asking Joe Blow down the street what's wrong with your car, or do you need to go check your manual? You check your manual, right? What is our manual? Thank you, Pastor Ron. What's your manual? What's our manual for life? God's Word. And if you read 2 Timothy chapter 3, it tells us exactly what we're supposed to do in these perilous, dangerous times. Uh, beginning in verse 14, it says, again, Paul, who loves his son in the faith, Timothy, is saying the following. But Timothy, continue you in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of who you have learned them, meaning himself, and of course the Lord. Verse 15, and that from a child, Timothy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, and let me just put a little aside here. 
he didn't he did he wasn't raised with the new testament he was raised with the old testament that's all they had available at that time this hadn't amen all of the old testament is meant to reveal jesus and that's what it does go to jet from genesis to malachi jesus is all there jesus after he resurrected took his disciples from from uh what is it moses to the prophets and he showed them where he was located man i would have enjoyed having that bible study we'll get to do that sometime <laughs> But all to say these holy scriptures, Timothy, that you have known from a child, which are able to make you wise. What's the context in these last of the last days? Wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, our trust in the Lord. And lastly, verse 16, for what purpose? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, teaching, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man, woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. As we close, if you wouldn't mind just, um, just closing your eyes with me just for a moment, I'm gonna do the same. And, and this is really what I want us to do right now. You heard some of the attitudes and some of the things that were listed there in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And if one of those stuck out to you, I just want you to personally just take a moment right now. Between you and the Lord, he hears you perfectly. If you talk to yourself, you talk to him, just say, Lord, I'm sorry for being boastful about this. I'm sorry for being more of lover of pleasure than a lover of you. Just right now, take that moment. Lord, thank you for speaking to the hearts of your people and that you didn't have me share this message without the intent of being able to bring freedom. As we sang already, Holy Spirit, you're the one that breaks down our walls and you're the one that brings in healing and restoration. You're the one that heals our hearts. Lord, we repent and we ask you, Holy Spirit, to take us by the hand and help us use and um, use, I guess is the right word, use the word of God in our lives to stand up against these wrong attitudes that corrupt and only bring death and destruction in our lives. We renounce every bit of those bad attitudes this morning in Jesus' name. And we right now receive a fresh release of your peace, your wisdom. And we declare over each and everyone watching and here live that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not because of anything we could do, but because of Jesus. Jesus. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. We look to you, Jesus. And when we stand before you, we want to be able to hear your words in our ears saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, thank you for the engrafted word that we have received with meekness this morning. Let it penetrate our thoughts throughout this week so that we can be the light that you've called us to be everywhere we go. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, bless you guys. Love you.